tonight, I, I don't know if you know this, but I spend a lot of time before the Lord seeking him for everything about this service, the psalm, everything. Uh, and this week, he got me up early to spend some time with him and gave me the psalm way ahead of time and gave me some things to look up in the psalm. And it was a beautiful, beautiful time, just him and me. And then he woke Mercy up. Well, I'm going to blame it on him. It could have been me in the coffee grinder. Uh, <laughs> Mercy was woken up by someone, and uh, she came out, and we were both studying and reading together. Different things, but when your best friend is sitting in the same room with you, and you're studying something as beautiful and awesome as the Word of God, you can't help but say, hey, hey, listen to this. And then that led to a beautiful time of prayer together. And gentlemen, this is what we should be doing with our brides. Uh, I know the seminars talk about dating and all these other neat little 12 steps or however many steps they have. Uh, but this is how we build that relationship with our brides. We seek the Lord first, and then we include our brides in that, and we lead them into the presence of the Father. And then we sit there together, praising our King. So, uh, Please turn to Psalm 105. 105. And you'll notice that the first two sentences end in a punctuation mark called an exclamation mark. What is an exclamatory remark? What, what, what are you, how are you supposed to read it when there's an exclamation point? Powerfully. Thank you. So, we read, Give thanks to Adonai. Call on his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. Sing to him. You know, we're going to be studying in chapter 8 of Acts tonight. We'll be talking about Philip. We'll be talking about Philip when he went up to Shamron. And what did he do? He declared Yeshua to them. He declared the gospel, as we would typically say. Well, what is the gospel? The gospel is this, that God has provided a way that God, who does not delight in the sacrifice of animals, has provided a way once and for all for there to be salvation and cleansing. And the name of that salvation and cleansing is Yeshua. Now, it says, make his deeds known among the peoples. That's what a testimony is. It's testifying to what he has done in your life. But we don't just testify to what he's done in our lives because, quite frankly, what he's done in Mo's life is pretty pitiful compared to what he's done for his people. He rescued us from Egypt. He delivered us. He brought us through the Sea of Suf. He kept us alive in the desert. Our shoes did not wear out. He had mercy upon mercy on us. He bestowed grace upon grace to us. He warned us when we were walking in sin, and He warned us about the impending diaspora. Yet we still wouldn't turn back. So eventually he scattered us to the four corners of the globe. And then what does he do? He starts gathering us when the time is right. He starts gathering us and bringing us home. Amen? 
Now we have a homeland to go to. Praise God! I, I had to answer a question. What does Zionism mean to you this week? Okay. This is going to tick off some flat earthers. Okay? I, and I know a lot of flat earthers who really get upset with me about Zionism. So I'm making the generalization. <laughs> Listen, Zionism has nothing to do with global banking. Okay? Zionism is this. The right of the Jewish people to exist in their homeland. The homeland given by God to us and promised to Avraham, to Yitzhak, to Yaakov, and on down through the centuries, generation after generation. That land is the land of Israel. On that eastern border of the Mediterranean, not down in Africa, not down in South America. These are all places where the world said, okay, we should, we should probably acquiesce and give these Jews a homeland. We'll give it to them over here. No, no, no. God said right there at Jerusalem, Zionism is Jews having a homeland and the beginning of the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. Right now, it's tiny. Right now, the borders are not what the biblical borders will be. Why? Because the nations are opposing. Goodness sakes, our people are opposing. Land for peace, right? Zionism is a nation for the king of the Jews to come back to. Amen? Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Talk about all his wonders. Whatever is right, whatever is holy, whatever is just, whatever is true, think on these things. Remember where it says to take every thought captive? Think on these things. Our mouths, listen, when you speak, you are speaking with air that doesn't belong to you. You're speaking with breath that is not your own. You are speaking using synapses that were given to you. They are a gift. You are a steward of your body. You are a steward of the breath in your lungs. You're a steward of those heartbeats that you have been given. Listen, if we are idle with our language, we're going to have to account for that. Scripture says that he has a book in which is written all of our words. Why? Because they belong to him. And here's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be making his deeds known among the peoples, singing to him, singing praises to him, talking about all his wonders. Glory in his name. Let those seeking Adonai have joyful hearts. Isn't it interesting when you're out there and you come across someone who is truly a disciple of Yeshua? There is joy in them. You can see it. You can feel it. You can smell it. Those folks have joyful hearts. It doesn't matter what their circumstances are. They have joy. Because joy and happiness are two different things. Joy is not dependent on my circumstances. Joy is dependent on my God. Joy is dependent on Yeshua, the fact that he has saved me, the fact that he is coming back, and the fact that in the meantime, he will be glorified in my life. In blessing or in discipline. Ha-ha, how's that? See, that's the beauty of our king, one of the beauties. Even when he disciplines us, 
It's for his glory. Seek Adonai and his strength. Always, get this, always seek his presence. Always seek his presence. Remember we talked a few weeks ago that we get to practice Sukkot every day? We get to practice being in his presence, the presence of God and the presence of Yeshua every day because he put his spirit in us. Seek Adonai and his strength. Always seek his presence. Remember the wonders he has done, the signs, that, that word speaks of the miracles that he has done, and, and his spoken rulings. What are the spoken rulings? His Torah, his divine law. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, and his Torah. We're supposed to be thinking on it. Psalm 1, on his Torah I meditate day and night. Yeah, we're to be, we're to be, we're to be remembering his Torah, the book of Leviticus. You descendants of Avraham, his servants. You offspring of Yaakov, his chosen ones. He is Adonai, our God. His rulings are everywhere on the earth. See, when, when Paul wrote Romans 1.20, you know what I'm talking about with Romans 1.20? For since, ever since the creation of the universe, his invisible qualities, both his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly seen because they can be understood from what has been made. Therefore, they have no excuse. That's Romans 1.20. This is where he gets it. <laughs> it's, it's so beautiful when you can see something from the Brit Hadashah, the Newer Testament, and say, there's where it is. His rulings are everywhere on earth. He remembers his covenant forever. Let me ask you. When he made his covenant with Avraham, was it dependent on Avraham? No. Avraham didn't walk through with those pieces of the animals. God walked through it. Interestingly enough, there were two items that represented God's presence that walked through. While surrounded in the thick presence of him. So now we have three aspects of him. the covenant he made with Avraham, the oath he swore to Yitzhak and established his law as a law for Yaakov, for Israel, as an everlasting covenant. You see, we, the theologians, we tend to look at this and say, well, we have the Mosaic, we have the, I'm sorry, we have the uh, Noahic, we have the Avramic, we have the Mosaic, we have all these different covenants. But what does God say? He says, the covenant, singular, he made with Avraham, the oath he swore to Yitzhak, and established his law for Yaakov, uh, for Israel as an everlasting covenant. That's one covenant. He's speaking of one covenant. It's not that the one covenant was deficient and had to be added to and retooled so that, no, no, it's one covenant. The difference is, the difference is, it went from the outside to the very inside to the point where in the Brit Hadashah, he writes it on your heart. To you, I will give the land of Canaan as your allotted heritage. Right there, people, is Zionism. When they were but few in number, 
Now we're going to remember his miracles. When they were but few in number, and not only few, but aliens there too, wandering from nation to nation, from this kingdom to that people, he allowed no one to oppress them. Yes, for their sakes he rebuked even kings. Don't touch my anointed ones or do my prophets harm. He called down famine on the land, broke off all their food supply, but sent a man ahead of them, Yosef, who was sold as a slave. They shackled his feet with chains and they bound him with irons until the time when his word proved true. God's utterance kept testing him. The king sent and had him released. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord over his household in charge of all he owned. Correcting his officers as he saw fit and teaching his counselors wisdom. You see, Yosef wasn't just doing the books. Yosef was in charge. Yosef was not just doing the books. He was correcting the officers of Potiphar. Who was Potiphar? He was in charge of the Egyptian intelligence. He would have been the head of the Egyptian CIA of that time. Their secret police, their CIA, whatever you want to call it. And Yosef was correcting his officers. <laughs> Yosef was teaching Potiphar's counselors wisdom. This slave, this Hebrew slave that was bought then Israel too came into Egypt. Yaakov lived as an alien in the land of Ham. There God made his people very fruitful, made them too numerous for their foes, whose hearts he turned to hate his people and treat his servants unfairly. You see, not only did Yosef do these things for Potiphar, but then he went into the prison and when he came out, he did these things for Pharaoh. He did these things on a much larger level. Then, God used that as the vehicle to bring his father and his brothers down into Egypt to escape the famine. And in doing so, established them. Jacob was born. Ah. But the people of Egypt turned to hate his people and treat his servants unfairly, it said. He sent his servant Moshe and Aharon, whom he had chosen. See, he sends those whom he chooses. They worked his signs among them, his wonders in the land of Ham. He sent Hoshek, darkness, and the land grew dark. They did not defy his word. Listen. He sent darkness, and the land grew dark. The darkness is a manifestation of what was already in the hearts. And he brought it out, and he made it so thick that it was paralyzing. Because if we saw what was actually in here, it would be paralyzing. It would grieve us so much. It says, they even though they were his enemies, did not defy his word. Why? Because, get this, it is impossible to resist the rulings of Adonai. Amen? It is impossible to resist the rulings of Adonai. He turned their water into blood and caused their fish to die. 
Their land swarmed with frogs, even in the royal chambers. He spoke, and there came swarms of insects and lice throughout their land. He gave them hail instead of rain, and with fiery lightning throughout their land. He struck their vines and fig trees, shattering trees all over their country. He spoke, and locusts came, and grasshoppers without number. They ate up everything green in the land, devoured the fruit of the ground. He struck down all the firstborn in their land, the first fruits of all their strength. Then he led his people out, laden with silver and gold. Among his tribes not one stumbled. Egypt was happy to have them leave because fear of Israel had seized them. What do you notice about this list? This list is missing some things. This list of the plagues, it does not include the judgments on the animals. Remember, there were sores that broke out on animals. There was a plague of disease. Also, they're not in order. It lists the darkness first. Did you ever notice that? It li here it lists the darkness first. Again, why is that? Because Egypt was dark. Spiritually, it was dark. You see, the U.S., spiritually, we are dark. There is Josek. Even the Christians, we can't see. We'll, we'll nod and say, oh, yeah, that's bad. But yet, look at our own lives. We let our children dabble in magic and watch movies and that glorify Satan, even teach how to do spells and demonic stuff. This is what we let our children do. See, the U.S., is dark. That darkness exists before the plagues. The plagues come as a result of our darkness. The plagues come as judgment because of our sin. He spread out a cloud to screen them off and fire to give them light by night. See, he screened them off from the scorching sun of the desert. It's hot. Talk to, any, talk to anyone wearing a turban riding a camel in the Egyptian desert. They will tell you, it ain't Antarctica. <laughs> it's hot. You've been there, right? It's hot, right? Miserably hot. <laughs> so God gives them a covering to protect them from the scorching sun. At night, he gives them a pillar of fire to give them light at night because everyone needs light at night. It gives them security. But what else does it do? As hot as it gets in the desert during the day, it gets cold at night. When they asked, he brought them quails and satisfied them with food from heaven. He split a rock and water gushed out, flowing as a river over the dry ground. For he remembered his holy promise to his servant Avraham. And let me ask you, were our people without sin in these instances? No. In each one of these instances, we were in rebellion. And yes, there was judgment, but there was also mercy. There was also so much mercy. For he remembered his holy promise to his servant Avraham. He led out his people with joy, his chosen ones with singing. Then he gave them, where do you think that singing came from? Where do you think that joy came from? It came from God. It was his gift to them. If he can give us songs in the night, he can certainly put songs on their hearts to be singing as they leave. Then he gave them the lands of the nations, and they possessed what peoples had toiled to produce in order to obey his laws and follow his teachings. You see, in Christendom, we tend to think that God blesses us because either A, we deserve it, or B, he's our slave. How can this be? 
Mercy showed me a video last week. And there's this adorable kid singing this song. Beautiful arrangement, beautiful cinematography. And the lyrics were started out okay, and then they got downright nauseating when this beautiful little child is singing about how he rose again for me. Listen, he didn't even go to the cross for you. He went to the cross out of obedience to his father. That's what Philippians chapter 2 says. We are taught from a very early age in Christendom that he died for you. No, he died out of obedience to his father. He rose again out of obedience to his father. He did everything out of obedience to his father. Amen? And because of his obedience to his father, we are blessed. We are blessed beyond measure. See, here it says, he led out his people with joy, he cho his chosen ones with singing. Then he gave them the lands of the nations, and they possessed what peoples had toiled to produce. He gave them all of this provision for what purpose? What purpose did he bless his people? He blessed them in order to obey his laws and follow his teachings. Why does God bless us? Does he do it just does he do it just because? Does God bless us because we are deserving? Because as his people? No, no. He blesses us for the sole purpose that we would obey him. When he gave us Torah and when he reiterated it through Moshe to the people, what did he say? If you obey me, you will have life and all these blessings. If you reject me, you're going to have death and all these curses. And then he said, choose this day. Choose life. He was pleading with us there. See, when we choose life, when we choose the blessing, we're choosing to obey him. We're choosing to obey his commandments. All of them. Not just what the theologians cherry pick. All of them. The tzitzit, the harvesting to the corners of your fields, all of it. The getting your enemy's cow out of the ditch on Shabbat, all of it. And then Yeshua came, and not only did he t show us th that it had to be lived out, but he showed us that it doesn't just get lived out out here. It has to be lived out out here and in here. It's a matter of the heart and the mind. Remember? He said, if you, if you hate someone in your heart, you're committing murder. If we're hating someone in our heart, that means that we're going, hello. No. We're either living in righteousness or we're living in sin. There's no gray area there. We're either applying the Torah of God to our hearts and our minds and taking every thought captive or we're just playing a game. And let me ask you this. Can you game God? No, you can't. But unfortunately, so many people are doing it, thinking they're going to get away with it. Thinking that they can game God, they can game the Holy Spirit. But the scary thing is, God cannot be mocked. You were blessed with redemption for the simple purpose of obeying his laws and obeying his teachings.
Romans 12, verse 4. For just as there are many... Is that right? That's not the, that's not right, the right passage. Okay, that was supposed to be Romans 2, <laughs> verse 4. Or perhaps you despise the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, because you don't realize that God's kindness is intended to lead you to turn from your sins. Now, if we are turning from our sins, what are we turning toward? If we are turning from lawlessness, we are turning toward Torah. If we are turning from disobedience, we are turning toward obedience to God's commandments. How beautiful is that? Then he gave them the lands of the nations, and they possessed what peoples had toiled to produce in order to obey his laws and follow his teachings. After that, what more can you say? All you can say is, say it with me, Hallelujah! Amen! <laughs>